Thank you for having me today and for joining the session. I, I would really thank the Franz Marc Foundation board for inviting me. Actually, the discussion started with them a few months ago when I just joined the Division of Clinical Informatics with Dr. Yuri Quintana. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Yuri Quintana was not available to join us today. Um, so Dr. Yuri has more than 15 years of working on collaborative research and collaborative platform. He, he spent the last 15 years at uh, St. Jude Hospital working on uh, Cure for Kids. It's a platform that is actually deployed in more than 187 countries with uh, more than 37 active uh, professionals on the platform. Um, he actually also led the project of implementing Transmart at St. Jude. Uh, for my part, I'm actually a physician, just joined the Division of Clinical Informatics, uh, a Harvard Medical School, uh, I was before that uh, working at MIT in an open source community on global health innovation. Um, so just to give an overview about our division of clinical informatics, it's actually among the first division in the world uh, in healthcare. Uh, and, and they were calling it a computational laboratory. So we started building in the 70s the first patient computer dialogue, a CCC, which is actually a first version of um, our electronic health record that's still in use now. Um, we were also among the first one to, to create Paper Chase, which is actually the predecessor of PubMed. Uh, we also created Clean Query, uh, which is actually an early stage of I2B2. Uh, so actually the discussion of today is not more about the technology per se, but is actually about our experience and what we learned from translational research. And when I joined the Division of Clinical Informatics, I had the chance to have an espresso machine at my office. Uh, so Dr. Yuri Quantana was coming by every time. And uh, we started a discussion about our experience of building, of using Transmart I2B2. For my part, I was implementing I2B2 for the last year and a half. Uh, and um, Dr. Yuri was using Transmart. But we had the same feeling and we, share, we were sharing the same skepticism about whether or not this implementation was providing a better outcome for clinicians. Uh, and whether or not the implementation itself was leading to improvement in the processes or improvement in the clinical care. And actually, uh, we start asking these questions. So we started, first of all, by understanding that we all know that there is a shaz between what's happening in the science and what's happening in the clinical uh, side. Um, there was this nature paper that was calling that a value of death. Um, and the problem being that neither the researchers, neither the clinicians, are trying to bridge that gap. And what ended up is that none of us understand actually what's translational research. Dr. Reedy being a PhD and me being a physician, we find ourselves interested about the subject, but not really understanding what's the real answer for it. And, and from there, we start generating hypotheses. So the first hypothesis that we generated was probably there is, there is a lack of understanding of translational research because there is not enough publication on that. So we did a very simple search on PubMed using translational research term in the title. And we found out that we were totally wrong. In the last year alone, we have more than 10,000 publications having translational research in, in its title. Um, and it's exponentially increasing with a growth probably around 2003, 2004, where actually the NIH started its roadmap to establish translational research at its core uh, it's, it's, it's core uh, services. So, um, and with the building of CTSA, more than 24 were built in the last five, six years. So from there we start, the bridge is actually built. Uh, but what's going on in the bridge is actually problematic. So from there we say, okay, let's look at what are the other features that are included in these titles? Uh, we looked at these titles, the 90th House publication, and we found out that most of the terms are actually on the left side of the bridge. It's on the scientist, the scientist side, on the basic research side, as you look at proteins, cells, genes, expressions. But actually, clinical uh, disease and patient only represent a fraction. I, I cannot even see that. I mean, it's probably on the right side. Um, so, so I understood that that's probably the issue. It's probably because we are only crossing one side of the bridge, we're not crossing the other side. And it's, I, I will do this analogy, it's like I'm, I bought a new car, I'm driving from Boston to New York, brand new car, all the tools, and I just didn't, I forget to put gas, and I just stopped in the, in the middle of the road. Um, 
So we start to then looking, um, can we create different phases, understanding this bridge, and rather than looking at it as one component, probably looking at it different steps. So we looked for previous publications, previous papers, looking at this, and we find, um, and based on the work of John Yanidis uh, and actually Huri, we found that there is four different definitions of translational research, and they are in different steps. So the f I'm just going through that very quickly. There is T0, which is probably the basic science, the gene uh, research, uh, more discoveries. The T1 is actually uh, more what we call phase one clinical trials, observational research and studies. Uh, T2, when it starts to be more interesting, when we're looking probably on human aspect of the application of, uh, of this research. Uh, T3 is the practice and creating the guidelines and evidence-based medicine. And T4 is actually the population level studies and how we can have a population level impact of this research. And actually by plugging um, different papers and different uh, research that were looking at how many grants and how many publications were in different phases, we find out that only 2% of all the publications are actually interested about the T2, T3, T4. Um, and, that's, and that's an important funding uh, because we believe actually that translation research community is actually has matured. As we see today in, uh, in this community, with Paula Villach's work, with, with all of you here, that's an impressive work that was not developed a few years ago. So, so we're trying then to understand what are the barriers, because we believe that build is, the bridge is built, but there is some barriers and challenges. And from there, uh, we start looking, does, did other people look at that and did they find answers? So Huri, in his, one of his paper was like, mentioning like all of the analysis um, highlighted that the continued lack of funding for translational research beyond best to bedside exists, we still don't know why, and the barriers and challenges aren't clear. So from there, we move to uh, one of our um, research, and we start looking at what are the different uh, platforms that exist. Um, there is I2B2, there is Transmart, there is uh, Brisk, iDash, and all of these were described in the literature. Uh, we describe their features, we describe uh, their challenges, we describe how they can be implemented, what kind of infrastructure, what's the premises. But none of the publications were looking at how effective and what are the challenges of implementing. And we start then building one of our framework. What we're trying to understand now is not anymore looking at the technology or looking at the infrastructure itself, but we are trying to look what are the different components that are hidden that are implicitly implemented in these projects. So for instance, what kind of governance this collaboration networks uh, implemented? Which one succeeded, which one failed? Um, we're looking also what kind of uh, data integration technology are they using? What kind of infrastructure were they using? Did some of these platforms were more uh, easy to use? Is it because of the usability? Is it because of the user interface? Um, my, one of my uh, expertise is actually in human-centered design in healthcare. Um, so we, I'm interested in that uh, subject. We have other people in our group who are interested probably about the outcomes. Is it because how can we prove that not only the research side is uh, effective, but also how we move it to the clinical side? So we're building this framework, and actually that's the presentation for today. And I'm, I'm asking the community to join us in this collaboration, trying to understand what they did for their implementation we, we, we start running um, a framework based on uh, empirical analysis using previous studies, using actually um, interviews and surveys. Um, we started by Transmart uh, Foundation Board. We started with uh, Atrix, with Ontinero, looking at how they were doing things and what can they learn and where can we learn? Because we believe that by learning these objectives, we will be able to improve further investment and actually uh, justify further implementation and being more effective. Um, I don't have a slide here, but in technology there is a hype. And the hype is like we go into the excitement and then there is a disillusion and there is actually a trend of improvement. And I think that translational research is actually on that hype. But we don't want to reach, we don't want to reach a, a, a fall into the disillusion uh, without understanding why and without being proactive and limiting that. 
So from there, I will just um, uh, ask you a question, is that what do you believe about, what do you think about that? And I wanna just have your, um, I don't wanna have a Q&A session, but I wanna just engage with you in this discussion and having your point of view. Um, I, will, I, will, um, I will start just giving a few of our results um, that uh, we just finishing. So one of these is that there is no formal evaluation of the factors that influence the success or failure of transitional collaborative networks. Um, in order to measure the success uh, of a collaborative platform, we need actually to define what's collaboration. Uh, and interestingly, we find more than 50 definition of collaboration and different and more than 15 different uh, framework for understanding it. Um, we also understand that the success of collaboration dep de depends on how we define it, the expected outcomes, and uh, that we need probably more models. We need to improve the models that are focused more on the return on investment, uh, that are more focused on the sustainability of the network itself on the long term, uh, and how we can create a roadmap uh, that, will, um, that will alleviate the challenges and the barriers. Um, so this is my... Uh, my small presentation. Um, I, I don't have any, uh, uh, what we're looking at is that having collaborators who are implementing I2B2 and we'd be willing, or Transmart or other technology, and we're willing to share their experience and feedback uh, to be part of this project. Um, so thank you very much for uh, listening. And I will just give you actually the, the side of the second half of the talk for you to just um, engage in the discussion. So thank you. Okay, well, look, we've got a little time, so we should get yes. to work. I, I mean, it let's fast. not waste this time. I mean, you've done this. <laughs> I don't waste time. You've done this work. So let, let me uh, ask the first question and try to get a dialogue going, because Paul referred to this in his talk as well, and that is uh, this comparison with these various platforms. You know, I would like to get into some depth here and have you describe, and maybe Paul, you can help us with this. Describe, you know, when you say, you know, Transmart does this, but iDash doesn't do that, or I2V2 versus Transmart, or, you know, uh, the CA Big uh, Constellation, you know, CA Tissue or something like that. You have a list, you know, and you've referred to a publication. And I want to know what makes Transmart different than some of these other services fundamentally. Yeah, so we're looking not only at that, but we're looking at the different components of it. I mean, like, not only the technology, per se, but probably more about what's the governance, how it's structured, how the collaboration is established. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions that we're trying to answer is, like, what are the different layers of collaboration? Because we have within institution collaboration, scientist, biostatistician. Mm -hmm. um, we have also between different institution collaboration issues mm -hmm. uh, that we're trying to analyze. Good. Paul's got some comments, and then, you know, when we kicked off Etrix, I went over there and described the difference between what I thought was going on here and CA Big, so we might get, get into that yeah. a little bit. Paul? And to answer to your question, one of the huge difference between all those different platforms that were integrating phenotypic data and omics data is the representation of the complex phenotypes. And Transmart was the only one who was able to do that because it's based on I2B2 hierarchy of concepts. That's how I've been showing you this morning. To be able to go down in the context of finding the different subtypes, you need to represent all those very complex phenotypes. A lot of those tools were presenting phenotype as in disease, yes versus no. Life is more complex than that. So that's why the main difference and why Transmart is so great in my point of view is because there's the I2B2 representation of the complex phenotypes. Good. I wonder if you guys can make a comment. Um, I2, uh, the I2B2 schema lends itself to personalize kind of N equals one because that's the schema underneath, whereas the Transmart schema looks at the study. You know, and we have this continuum between the individual, the study, and the population. So uh, explain that, and let me, let me turn it over to, I'm just trying to get a conversation. Yes, well, I, I pointed this very quickly, but the way I, we've implemented Transmart is to, because we didn't like the way it was separated per, per study, the way, so what we did is we only have one study ID in all our Transmart. The, because the study ID representation okay, so doesn't work. 
yes. So there's only one one study ID, and then I can I recreate the access control per pass to say that, for example, autism, and then Simon Simplex is the study one, uh, Autism Consortium is another one, Agree is a third one, and the pass using the I2B2 pass makes the access control per different study, and it works. Yes. Yes, because at the end of the day, we want to make... Uh, Paul told me earlier when we were hearing about the Berner Ingelheim uh, TR uh, by smart or be smart, then the criticism was that uh, uh, we had too many different subsets for studies under Transmart that in fact you can put them together and Paul has done exactly that under one study label. Yes, but it really depends on the way you source data is and uh, in it's funny how Eric Peraklis, who created Transmart at the beginning, who's now one of the directors at the Center of Biomedical Informatics where I work, when he sees the way we're using Transmart today, he laughs saying, I didn't invent that. I didn't think of using Transmart this way. You're using it a different way. Why? Because the search tool he created in Transmart as an app on the right search tool that was really with a new great effort with the 1.2 to create the face search, which is much better, the dataset explorer based on I2B2 and the sample explorer, the three main components. And the, in Transmart at Johnson & Johnson, they've been using the search tool much more than the dataset explorer because he didn't have patient level data. And the only patient level data he had were from the clinical trials, which were completely separate. And he couldn't make the links between them or only on a very specific use cases. So that's why he created, he used the I2B2 model and added this study ID because he needed to represent that. But the study ID, what we do, in, I use it a different way. And everybody here in the room used Transmart in a different way. It depends on what source data you have, what are your use cases. In my case, I wanted to create this patient-centered information common, so the study ID didn't help me. It was just a, 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 an issue. The, I, I, my postdoc project, when I arrived at Zach's team 14 months ago, I was going to stay only one year, and was to work on the across trial uh, functionality. And, and this, I couldn't manage to, to, to have this working and to be, because I was limited in the different type of use cases, so my answer to that was, well, go back to the I2B2 model. There's no studies, different studies. There's only one study ID, and the access rights works by the pass level. And I haven't shown you that, but it works. We may manage to have it working by pass level, and also we have the access control per type of application so that the advanced workflow is an option. Not everyone has it. This sample explorer is an adoption. It's based on the URL. No, oh, that's very good. I think that this, this, we, we really need to um, document this and actually publish this because this is very important because it's going to provide, you know, meaningful guidance to the community in terms of what you want, you know, and it goes back and I'm, I'm going to ask you to bring that slide of that list up because it really goes back to the purpose these tools were invented in the first place. And your comment about what Eric's problem was at Johnson & Johnson is relevant. Because their problem was, as I recall, they had 125 different data sources, and none of the data sources could be merged together, and they couldn't find anything across studies or even within a study. And that was the problem that Gary Neal gave him to solve when Transmart was invented in the first place. And so, you know, that was the motivation. Sherry? Yeah, just follow up question actually for Paul because um, we actually thought about using this so-called, uh, we, we think of it as a more of a cheating way or doing, merging different studies into one super study and become essentially that's a cross study analysis, right? Um, but the issue is when you are generating data incrementally, say a subset of patients over time, um, for the high dimensional data, say microarray or other data, you essentially you have to do a batch normalization step. And um, do you, so every time when you get a new batch of data, do you normalize every time? Or how do you handle that refresh database? Or just kind of, you know, a technical question. 
in our case, we haven't uh, solved the issue of incremental. Yeah. Uh, what we prefer to do, because it's much faster, is to erase everything per data type and to reload it. We have a data creation server where we store everything ready to be uploaded. And for the across trial functionality, how we make it work is to have study A, Yankee, underneath study B, Yankee, underneath study C, and then we have underneath that a new folder called across concept analysis. And then we do the mapping across the mapping of the, the concepts that are relevant to be able to be study across. For example, epilepsy is one of them because it's in, in multiple studies. So we created a new ontology of what could be mapped. Then, so today what we do, I haven't shown you that, but today what we do is we store in the observation fact table multiple facts, so we repeat it. So it's not the best way in the context of storage issue, but the I2B to resolve this three years ago of having one line per fact that can be represented multiple times in the concept hierarchy. This is today in the code of I2B2 in Transmart, today, but it's silent. And that's correct. And, and you know, this is something that's very important to point out. A lot of the features, and this is where the API is going to help us, because a lot of the useful features of I2B2, for various reasons, were turned off. They need to be turned back on. Yeah. And, you know, we did have a very nice conversation with Jack and Hanna about this point a few weeks ago, Gil and I, and there's very much openness here. And the API is the way. Yep. There's no question about it. But we need fully functional I2B2 capability to work with Transmart to get us to actually yes. be able to do this. And, for example, you know, they... I want everybody in this room to understand this. Because this is fundamental. You wonder why he's the magic guy over here. The reason he's the magic guy is because he's using the full functionality in a way that's principled against the n equals one concept that was laid out in the hierarchy in the first place. Am I right or wrong? Because, well, I've been working a lot with I2B2 first before going to Transmart. And this is a very important lesson. Yeah. And to look at the I2B2 documentation of there's a lot of functionalities. And all the time when my developers say, I want to do this this way, I say, well, no, it has already been resolved in I2B2. Look at the documentation because it's already in the, in present in the code. There's not everything, but it's really worth it. For example, one of the modifiers. Modifiers is something crucial to represent yeah. complex data type in when you have, for example, a drug prescription. You can't represent a drug prescription in one observation fact. You have, for example, the name of the medication, then underneath the drug, then you have the route, then you have the period. All those and facts indication. and the indication, all those facts are different lines in the observation fact table. You need to link them together. And that's, you do it with the modifiers that can be queried. And we resolve, we've put the modifiers back in the I2B2 in Transmart to represent, for example, for CTEX, for the natural language processing, to say for one concept, erythema, is it for the patient? Is it family history? Is it positive? Is it negative? And this functionality was present in the I2B2 code in Transmart. And the, the last really crucial version between the, today in Transmart, there's the 1.6 version of I2B2. Yep. The 1.7 is the temporal, temporal. relation yeah. to be able to say that this fact comes before this one. And this is crucial when you're using, when you're querying. What, what happens is you have to do it. What, what I had to do in Paris is to hard code, to hard code it, making the SQL queries. But, and we are working on having but that's a lot of work, to have the 1.7 version of I2B2 in Transmart, because that's crucial. Right, it's absolutely crucial. So, EK, we need to, in our discussions following on, and in the content committee, or sorry, in the code committee, this ought to come up. Uh, you know, for the time being, I was going to put the ontology services in the, in the content committee, and the ontology services are absolutely critical for this as well, and you demonstrated that quite nicely. Mm -hmm. All these functions are really great, but we have to really embed it back into the new systems in a modular way, as I said, right? Remember, in the 1.1, we talked, uh, we actually decoupled I2B2 with Transmart, with reason, right? It's not just uh, the license issue, but I also have the reason of the really try to make code modular. I 
absolutely agree with you uh, to be to add a lot of functions to particularly for medical applications, not necessarily for really biomarker study, but it's absolutely very useful for healthcare side, medical side. We will put it back, but it will be done in a modular way. So we have to make a very wise decision. Is a part of the core or part of the add-on? So that is the beauty we have now. So we got to really balance, don't make the system too fat. And you will be the, in my opinion, you will be people usually call the, what they call advanced user or even the, you know, top users, but you will be only 1%. But you not really develop your system for 1%. So what you do is you really think very careful about what is the core, what is the advanced function. Otherwise, the system will become really, really unmaintainable and too big. And that's why I, I repeated multiple times, that's the way we use I2B to, uh, Transmart, because based on the data we have and the use cases we have, and I fully understand that everyone can have, and that's what's great with Transmart, you can use it the way you want based on your source data. Okay, Kate and then Garrett. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to maybe bring in this conversation a little back to the original topic, which is translational research and then collaborative translational platforms. So I think what comes out of this discussion, what you see happening in practice, is that um, Transmart is a platform used by multiple people, you, using it for very different purposes. If I look across our clients as the Hive, for example, then um, the way we use it for the academic medical centers is quite different from the pharma customers, which really yeah. bring clinical trials into the system. And to answer the question why Transmart is successful, um, I think that that is the key of Transmart, that we were basically using this one platform. It's not always an easy battle, but we are all using it and um, slowly getting to a model where you can have these different um, ways of doing research. So the basic research, the patient-centered research, and the population-based research all in one system. So um, I would like to comment on what GK said. Um, uh, that, uh, well, we should make sure that we put not all our efforts on something which is being used by only a, a small minority of the users. And uh, you mentioned uh, 1%. But um, I think what Paul has been showing us uh, certainly goes much wider than 1%. That I think that would go for all uh, academic translational researchers. We heard the presentation yesterday from Matthias. I completely recognize from the oncology side the way that he has set up the, the, the clinical side of the, um, of the work. So I think this is a, a very wide need and um, I would be very keen to have that actually in, in the system. Okay, I, sorry, there's one percent that doesn't mean we don't really put in the system. What I mean is put the core system. What is the core, what is add-on, that's a different game. So basically what you can do is you have a core system for 80% users, and then now you have a specific modules where you can add on to the system. For example, it's a, with the wider percent that doesn't mean we don't really put in the system. What I mean is put the core system. What is the core, what is add-on, that's a different game. So basically what you can do is you have a core system for 80% users, and then now you have a specific modules where you can add on to the system. For example, it's a, with the widely used in the medical area, we are called Transmart with medical plugin and put this function into it. So we want to maintain the core system with cover as broad as you can, and then with the specific system modules aiming for a particular community. But I'm not saying 1% is not important. That's not my, what I'm saying. Jared, I'm oh. going to give you one last teensy weensy <laughs> word here and I want to get to Gil's but talk. I, I've got a feeling that we're entering into a kind of uh, artificial separation between medical and, and translational because um, in the end yeah. it is about the association between biology and phenotype and uh, we can be very detailed in our um, readouts of biology but if we uh, remain very coarse in our details of, uh, of phenotype then our associations are never going to deliver what we want of it.